Hi there. Let's talk about graphic narratives. In this lecture, I want to introduce you to bande de dessinée in Europe and how they came to shape and form the direction of the became known as the graphic novel. So to begin with, let's talk about how comics are produced in Europe and how that's different from how they're produced in the United States and in Japan. In Europe, comics appear five pages a month in magazines that have about six stories. So in those stories, you'll see them featured in a magazine and then among other stories. And then the, finally, the, if you want to read the whole thing together, you will collect the albums that are 60 pages and they're hard covers and they're quite large format. So they have a very dramatic uh, feature. Usually kids, if they want to, to read these, will ask for them for Christmas because they're quite expensive. Each album will cost perhaps as much as 40 to $50. In the United States, we have 35-page comics with an awful lot of ads in them. And they usually have one story, maybe two stories in them. These now are collected and compiled together, uh, perhaps in about a year's time, to a 150-page graphic novel, which can be either hardcover or more likely paperback. In Japan, there will be only six pages a week in a magazine with 25 other stories. So, with six pages a week, you're getting a lot of variety of stories coming at you constantly. And so there's a huge variety of stories. And only the very popular stories are then collected and resold into these small 150-page Tankabon. So one, another important difference between Europe, U.S., and Japan is in the United States, the artists who create the comics uh, do not own the copyright, typically. And in Europe and Japan, it, the artists work with the publishers and the artist owns the copyright of the characters that they are creating. Comics have a long history in Europe. At the beginning of the 20th century, they were widely seen as uh, American imports. Le Journal de Mickey in the 1930s was the, the mainstay of French comics, and a lot of this started to rankle on French comic artists who found it very difficult to break in with so many imports coming in. During World War II, there was a massive disruption and there were more opportunities for French comic artists to emerge. Following World War II, American imports started to come in again in mass. And in 1949, in France, there was a commission for the oversight and control of publications for children and adolescents, which recommended that they adopt laws to protect French language and French culture by banning American comic imports, Batman, Tarzan, and things like that. It's no coincidence that 1949 was just a year after Frederick Wertham's magazine article horror in the nursery, which really sparked the start of the debate about the anti-comic crusades in the United States. So much of what was happening in France and elsewhere in Europe was really inspired by the criticisms leveled at the comic industry from the inside the United States. One popular character that emerged at this time, it had been uh, visible beginning and during the war, was Tintin by Hergé, who's the pen name for Georges Rémy. 
The name Hergé is actually the initials G-R reversed, R-G or R-J in French. And Georges Remy's creation of Tintin is this boy reporter who doesn't seem to do a whole lot of reporting, but he does an awful lot of saving the day and going on really colorful and exciting and fun adventures with his dog, Snowy. This has been a staggeringly popular character throughout the world. 200 million copies of the comic books have been sold to date with translations into 58 languages. I know many people who have learned new languages by reading Tintin in French or German or Indonesian or Italian. Here is a list of the various albums that have been published of Tintin's many adventures. These are 24 in all. Some of the early volumes are no longer printed because they represent characters and stories which are a little bit too, uh, to say the least, insensitive to cultural differences. But there's a really wide range of adventures here going to all kinds of parts of the world. And Tintin, in his adventures, is sort of your, your classic European in the sense that he, he cares deeply about things, but he's not there to save the day. He's not a vigilante. He doesn't have any great overarching message or theme. He's just there to make sure the right thing gets done at the right time. These stories have been spun out into five movies, a radio show, two animated features, and a pair of theater adaptations. Here we can see the original art in the Tintin magazine for Explorers on the Moon, published in 1954. Now, what's really remarkable about Anna Jay's work is the precision and clarity. He's a really fine craftsman who spends an incredible amount of detail trying to get the technology, the cars, the automobiles, the rocket ships to look real, to feel right, to be something immersive that you want to read over and over again. Here, the style in its full glorious color you can see is often referred to as Linclair or clean line. And there's no shadow or very little shading and the energy and the excitement and the movement of the characters through these scenes is just spectacular. There's a wonderful sense of adventure, a wonderful sense of these characters are engaged in these fantastic worlds that he is exploring. The other uh, really popular characters, aside from the captain, are the Thompson twins, who are the sort of slapstick additions to the stories of Tantan. One of the things that makes Hergé so much fun is a real page turner. This would be at the bottom of the page and the cigars would explode and you'd be like, oh, what happened? And then you'd want to turn the page. And that was the thing that he... Georges Remy was really good at was getting people to keep wanting to turn the page. Aside from Tintin, um, Pilot Magazine had another very popular hit, Asterix, set in a sort of fantastical past of Gaulish uh, France with the Roman occupation, and the Gauls are sort of resisting their colonial overlords in a, a kind of funny and irreverent way. So there's a lot of really interesting sort of tensions between the various languages and the various cultures throughout Europe and the Mediterranean that are played on in Asterix. But these are all very easy, sweet, fun stories. There's not a whole lot of deep political engagement. And that would have to change. In 1968, as we know, there was these Paris student protests, and the Situationist International introduced this idea of detournement, this idea that art needed to engage and disrupt 
and subvert the narrative of the capitalist world. And artists, comic artists, felt this need to to be edgier, to speak about more important issues, and to throw off the shackles of this very conservative Boy Scout culture that had been kind of holding French culture back for quite some time. One of the edgier artists who emerged at this time in Paris was Guido Quipa, who had his star characters, Valentina, who's always in this sort of tight clothing, short dresses, short cropped black hair. And he loved to do pages like this, where the characters are tightly cropped into smaller and smaller scenes, sort of fragmenting the moment, allowing you to kind of see all the sort of details. But this very striking black and white qualities, which is very graphic and very visually exciting, again, with realistic details and very compelling uh, storylines, fantastic uh, science fiction, fantasy, and horror, all kind of mixed in together. Another very popular character to emerge at this time was Corto Maltese, created by Hugo Pratt. In his amazing adventures, Corto Maltese sort of lived in the hinterlands of the colonial empire, fighting off villains and corruption. And again, like Tintin, he doesn't have any great ambition to save the day or be a hero. He's just there to kind of make sure the really bad guys don't get away with doing really bad things. And he seems to have enough of himself that he walks away without any sense of larger purpose. Here we can see Corto Maltese in the sort of visual style that was really quite exciting, the way in which the ink, the sort of solid ink is used to kind of energize the falling rocks and to create this sense of drama and action during this avalanche. We can also see things like crashing waves. Again, we've become very aware of the play of ink on the paper. More realistically and more fantastically, Jean Gerard, also known as Mobius, was a stellar artist who had an extraordinary career and was enormously influential on fantasy art in the United States. As most people who follow science fiction will know, he worked with Jodowski on a science fiction film called Dune, maybe you've heard of it, that was never actually produced. It's become known as the most famous movie never produced. And Jean Girard worked on that film, and the art that he created for that greatly influenced a lot of movies and science fiction films, including Star Wars, that came out subsequently. Here you can kind of see Gerard was really fascinated with deserts and violent landscapes, the way in which innocence and violence, you know, crash up against each other. And there's this uh, really uh, palpable sense of the physical world sort of invaded by technology. A lot of these artists, especially in science fiction, were gathered together in a new publication that appeared in Paris known as Metal Herlant, or Screaming Metal, first featured in 1974 to 1987. It was disappeared for a bit and then revived in 2002. Metal Herlant was a really important magazine that really wanted to push the boundaries of the comic art into more expressive and experimental areas, doing stories that were edgier, more violent, more horrific, uh, and really try and get to spur the imagination of what was possible in, in comic art. 
Back in the United States, U.S. warned publishing to get out from under the saltifying effects of the Comics Code began publishing a series of comic magazines that specifically uh, dealt with adult themes, Creepy and Vampirella, again, dealt with more adult themes and horror issues and and monsters, and fantasy. And this was sort of the beginning of an attempt to address an audience that had been really left behind with the adoption of the comics code. Metal Hurlant comes into the scene in 1977, and it's a giant wake-up call to a lot of American artists who have been really grounded in realism and heavy metal really becomes a, an artistic exploration of a very dramatic and visceral kind of artwork that American artists found very exciting and became hugely influential. Here's a little review. Question one. How are French... American, Japanese, and comic publications different? Question two. How did France deal with the flood of American comics after World War II? Question three. What changed the character of French comics, Bande de Dizine, in the 1960s? Question four. How were post-1960 Bandi Dizine different? Question 5. How did Bandi Dizine come to the U.S.?